Hi everyone, this is Trevor Jones from astrobackyard.com and galaxy season is finally here. In this video, I'm gonna use my camera and telescope to take a picture of a galaxy that lies 17 million light years away. Black Eye Galaxy, or M64, is not your ordinary spiral galaxy. Between its dark, lidded appearance, anemic spiral arms, and a core that's rotating in the wrong direction, this deep sky object has a lot going on. The last time I photographed M64, Rudy wasn't born yet. He's nine now, so I think it's about time to update my latest photo with a new version. What do you think of that? I've got my biggest astrophotography telescope all wired up and I'm hoping to take my best image of M64 yet. The Black Eye Galaxy has a way of standing out in a crowd. Its prominent feature is a band of dark dust that spans across its bright core. It gives it the appearance of having a black eye, I guess. Kind of a violent image. If you don't like that one, how about the evil eye? I think it looks like the boiled cream treat from Skyrim. Well, it's officially classified as a spiral galaxy. The spiral arms of the black eye are atypical. Something just isn't right. Astronomers call it an anemic spiral with less defined spiral arms and a slower rate of star formation. Here's where it gets good. Unlike most galaxies where the core rotates with the rest of the spiral arms, the core of the black eye rotates in the opposite direction of the outer regions of the galaxy. How does this happen? This counter rotation is believed to have been caused by a merger with a smaller companion galaxy. The two galaxies have combined into one and now it's kind of wonky looking. I think this is one of the reasons I haven't photographed it in so long. I just didn't really like the look of it. Now I really dig the weird objects and I'm excited to get a close up shot of it. It's the perfect time of year for this one. It's in the spring constellation Coma Berenices. This area, along with Virgo nearby, is absolutely packed full of galaxies for you to observe and photograph with your telescope. To capture the Black Eye Galaxy up close, you're gonna need some serious magnification. At only 10 arc minutes wide, this galaxy looks pretty small through most telescopes. The last time I photographed this one, it was using an 80 millimeter refractor, and it was tiny. This time, I'm using a much larger telescope to get right in there. The Celestron Edge HD 11 has a focal length of about 2,000 millimeters when the reducer is in place. This will provide the perfect field of view for the full frame camera I'm using. The not so good news is there's gonna be a full moon in the night sky tonight. This means that all of my images may look a little washed out, but I have to take what I can get. If you can set up your telescope on a moonless night away from the city lights, you'll get a much better result than I do. Okay, time to get set up. That moon is bright. Normally I wouldn't shoot a target that's so close to the direction of the moon either, but that's just where it lies tonight. I think I'm far enough away where it's not gonna just be totally a waste of time just shooting right into the moon. It's just got a little bit of distance between it. And let's just take a little preview exposure. We'll do 10 seconds so you can see what the black eye galaxy looks like through this F7 scope at 2000 millimeters in a 10 second exposure. And it's not gonna look like much, I'll tell you that right now. Okay. Well, it looks like we're centered. I'm just zooming in here. Yeah, not a whole lot of going on there in terms of features. Hopefully in a longer exposure image, We'll see more than that, but not much to write home about right now. So let's see what two minutes looks like. Got about five seconds left before that comes through. You can see the sparse clouds I'm shooting through as well. It's always good. Let's see what we got. Okay. Wow, that is just it is really faint. I mean, we're looking at the core of the galaxy, but it extends much larger than that. So we're not getting out any of the outer regions. This is gonna be tough. So I'm really hoping that this starts to look better as it gets higher in the sky. 
although that moon will be following along with it. I don't know about this one, guys. It's two days later and I'm pivoting. Usually I can scrape together an image with even a little bit of decent data, but what I captured on Monday night was unusable. The combination of a dim object, a full moon, no filter and clouds. I mean, I was shooting right into the moonlight, but tonight I've got a new plan and a new telescope. See, one of the biggest problems with my last setup was a lack of a dew shield. Can you believe that? The most simplest of accessories bringing my mega size scope to its knees. SCTs are known to collect a lot of moisture on the objective lens. And even with two dew heater bands running at full blast, that corrector plate was covered after only an hour. To make matters worse, all of that stray light from the full moon was being collected as well, washing out my image. This is the dew shield I want because it clips on securely to the scope and would give me a nice flat surface to capture flat frames. I honestly can't believe I used this scope for so long without one. So until I get a dew shield for that bad boy, I'll be using it for solar system photography and observing only. In the meantime, I swapped it out for a refractor telescope with a big dew shield on the end. This system will give me better contrast images, especially with that moon a little farther away tonight. I'm using the same camera, which provides a better image scale than the last scope, but the galaxy will be smaller overall. Can't win them all. Okay, I think I have the new setup all ready to go, but once again, the forecast looks a little questionable. The latest model I saw in Astrospheric shows it clearing up at around 4 a.m., so I may have to set the alarm. So I'm just looking at my image data on the second night of imaging the Black Eye Galaxy, the better night using the refractor. And Deep Sky Stacker has these really cool scoring tools where it really analyzes your individual sub-exposures and it can tell you a lot about your image data and which frames you should get rid of and which ones you should stack. So even if you're using a tool like WBPP in PixInsight, which probably does a better job of stacking, Deep Sky Stacker is still really valuable for, for checking things out and I still like to use it. So what we're looking for here is the score. So by registering these pictures, I've Deep Sky Stacker has provided a score for me. The best scores are gonna have the smallest stars, uh, hopefully a darker sky background, higher number of stars, and those are the kind of signals that create a better score. So if we go to the bottom of the list, you know, you would think that these are the worst frames and they are. Uh, so let's just take a look at it. If we click on the best score image, it should look nice. There we go, a nice dark sky background, sharp stars. And if we go down to the bottom of the list by comparison, Let's see what this one looks like, a 392. Much, much worse. What I wanted to point out is the sky background percentage. So I like to sort it by that sometimes because even though this one got a decent score, kind of middle of the road, the sky background is really high and I don't want to stack this and deal with those gradients and that, you know, figuring out uh, how to bring back that background sky. So I'm also going to get rid of all the ones with the brightest sky background. So what's happening for these frames is they're, they're likely the ones that were taken near the light dome low on the horizon as I was shooting this target. As it got farther away, that sky brightness got better and better and improved. So I'm just gonna get rid of anything above 18%, it looks like here. So, and we can, we can click on it and see how bad it is. So this is a 17% sky background compared to a seven. Big, big difference here. So I'm actually, because I've got enough frames here, it looks like 147 currently, I'm gonna get rid of all of the ones past maybe even 8% because it looks like I have a lot that are under 7%. These ones are nice and dark. Yeah, I think I'm only gonna stack those ones. I don't think I'm gonna do much for my image by stacking these ones with this uh, bright sky behind it. So why don't I get rid of everything above 10%. How's that? I know it hurts to get rid of your precious image frames. Like I got rid of a lot there, um, but I really don't think you're doing yourself any favors by stacking those. So you can kind of go through and then sort by the different categories um, by number of stars. Obviously, if there's more stars, the better. So let's just look at that one. What's the worst offender here for stars? This one that we're on has 61 versus 136. Yeah, you can tell that's better data. So why don't I even get rid of some of those too? 
the 61, anything where there's a big drop off really. So why don't I say anything under 80? Looks like the sky background was brighter in those too. So I'll stick with that. We're left with 120 light frames, but those are interesting columns to look at um, when you're going over your image data, deciding on a night like this, which frames are worth stacking, which ones aren't. Well, M64 turned out to be a bit of a challenge. These small galaxies, I tell you, they don't mess around. If you've ever gone after this one yourself, you know what I mean. Switching telescopes was the right move, until I get that dew shield. In the end, I collected a solid six hours of good data on the black eye. And despite the hiccups along the way, it's my best picture of this galaxy yet.